I was introduced to multiculturalism when I was a child growing up in South Africa in the early 1990s. For me, it was the election of Mandela. And when I saw different faces in the school playground that I understood the term, it was finally living together. I then traveled to America and Europe and discovered that multiculturalism could be a source of concern in some circles. How can we live together when we don't speak the same language and don't have the same traditions or the same cultural references? Does living in a multicultural society mean adapting to others or giving up part of your cultural identity? When I came to live in France, I discovered Asterix. Perhaps using this comic book hero is the funniest and most unconventional way of asking all of these questions. In the comics, the little hero defends his village against the Roman invasion. But at the same time, he travels and encounters many other cultures. Make sense? Make sense. Welcome to Make Sense, a leap in pop culture to explore societal challenges. A podcast from Skimmer Business School. So, I decided to introduce him to Anke Middleman. Anke is a German who works in France and who has lived in the UK for many years. She is a senior lecturer in multicultural management and director of the Global Executive MBA at Schema Business School. My name is Mary Michaelides, and I can't wait to see her reaction to the many stereotypes of the turbulent world of Asterix. Hello, Anka. Hi, Mary. It's lovely to see you. Your life is full of traveling. You were born in Germany and you've lived in the UK. You've lived in Belgium and you've lived in the US and you've spent a good part of your life abroad, I would yes. say. So my question is, do you feel like Asterix? <laughs> That's a lovely question to start this podcast with. Um, I do and I don't. Um, I do in the way that um, Asterix moves around and he has lots of adventures. He's confronted with lots of difference um, and, um, you know, and lots of misunderstandings because I've been through all of those in, in my life, whether they are linguistic or just not understanding the reasons for something. Um, so that is something where when I read Asterix, it resonates with me completely. There is a big difference um, because Asterix always goes home. He goes back to his community. He goes back to his village. He has these wonderful feasts um, at the end of every story. Whereas my life journey kind of took me from one place to the next. And I never went back to home base in the same way as he did, which means that my cultural experience as a result have become very different. Um, Another thing about Asterix is that his um, adventures uh, were time limited. Um, so, you know, it's fairly short. Whereas with me, every one of the destinations you've quoted was at least three or four years. And so you have a very different um, approach to living because you have to live in that environment right you can't just say okay I'm just going to dip my toe in a little bit here because I know I'm going home two weeks from now it was open-ended and so you, ha you have to take a very different approach to it uh, so I think those would be some of the fundamental differences between Asterix and me. How would you define multiculturalism? We often use cross-cultural, multicultural, and intercultural in quite an interchangeable way. And yet there are subtle differences between them. And I think it's, it's probably quite important to highlight those. So for me, cross-cultural is the one where we make a comparison between two cultures or where we look at two cultures and we look at our this and this. What happens often is that we do it through the lens of one of those two cultures. So it may not be as objective as we would like it to be. Multicultural is yet different yet again. And it's when you have a setting where different cultures exist in the same space, in the same area. But they are 
separate entities and they do not necessarily have to interact with each other on a, on a consistent basis. So, you know, you have that diversity, but not necessarily interacting all the time. It's the intercultural that is the one that goes deeper because this is the one where you interact with people from different um, cultural backgrounds um, and different settings uh, with different belief systems. And this is the one that goes the deepest for me. So having said all of that, it doesn't mean that we have to just be in one mode or the other. We probably find ourselves segueing between the three isms. And it depends on circumstances as well. You know, it's impossible to be just cross or inter or multicultural. But we find that certain groups of populations, for example, expats often may live somewhere else, but they may not mix with the local population. So that would be more of a multicultural um, existence where uh, you who have a French family and I had an intercultural marriage as well, that would be a real intercultural setting, for example. So when you talk about the culture in multi or intercultural, what does that mean? Fuzzy concept, that is. <laughs> and it's not easy to define. If you look for a definition of what it actually is culture, you get um, hundreds of different, um, different definitions of it. Now, one of the things um, that becomes clear, however, is that we have culture that is visible and culture that is invisible. So, for me, I use a, um, a visualization of what's known as a cultural iceberg with a small visible part of the iceberg, which is basically the, you know, the, um, the visible elements like the architecture, the food, the, the way we dress, the heroes that we admire, the way we work, for example, everything that we can um, ascertain with our five senses. And then the invisible stuff, which is much, much bigger, is the values, beliefs and attitudes that we've grown up with in life. So for me, culture is both parts of the iceberg and that makes it even more complex. So given what you say, Anka, we could argue that uh, Asterix is a little bit more multicultural than intercultural based on his experiences. Uh, he's visited many countries, but he still remains this proud goal that hangs on to his um, reputation and defending his people. Maybe this could be seen as a symbol of withdrawal into oneself and protecting one's identity. Asterix is really interesting um, because he is an iceberg in himself. Asterix and Obelix on their on their many voyages, uh, they do slightly touch other icebergs too, right? Because obviously they go to the Middle East, they go to Britain, they visit the Vikings, they deal with the Romans, all these other icebergs on a daily basis, um, and they do touch occasionally. Now, this is what happens when you come across another culture is that you immediately, the icebergs touch below the surface. So you see something that's different, but the reaction comes from clashing beliefs and values underneath. And this causes the uh, reactions to another culture. Uh, what's interesting about the Asterix uh, stories is that we see these reactions all the time. If you look at some of the Asterix books, some of the wonderful things that come out is the, the reactions to otherness. I think one of the big ones most people around the world have is around food because food is something so essential to us that we immediately have a strong reaction when something tastes differently. And, um, you know, and of course, this is a French comic and, you know, the French and the, the, the British have had a interesting relationship over the centuries. And so the asterisk in Britain is just wonderful about this notion of boiled boar rather than roast boar served with something like tepid beer or cold iced red wine, which is something that not even Obelix, who will never refuse food, can stomach. Okay, so those reactions can um, actually make people go ethnocentric quite easily. Ethnocentric being seeing things from this idea of my culture, and my culture is 
best because that's what I'm used to. It's what I've been brought up to believe. It's the values that have been given to me all my life. And that makes becoming intercultural quite difficult so that you have that segueing into it a little bit, but with a bit of resistance at the same time. And it's a tension that all of us have all the time. So being multicultural may denote adapting to others. And there's this idea when you adapt or when you're acculturate, you may have to give up your own identity, your values, your traits, your practices. Are asterisks and obelix asterisks and obelix when they're in another village? I can juxtapose this with an interesting example from Asterix and Cleopatra. Obviously, we can deduce that they spend a lot of time in Egypt. And at the end, um, obelix is, he makes a menhir that resembles an obelix, so Egyptian style. And the Gaul leader arrives and he says, let's stay Gaulois. So, you know, can you, can you keep your identity? This is, a huge question um, and a question for many people. We've had that first tension of wanting to understand and, and but still reacting from our own lens when we meet difference. Then that next step is, do we adapt? What do we adapt to? And what's interesting here is that we can go back to human nature and to our instincts, and our instincts are always, um, or for most people, that what is different is dangerous, which is a quote from Gert Hofstede, one of the really the main influential early researchers in the field. And he coined this because he said, you know, there are lots of people around the world who consider what they don't know with suspicion. In this context, I think it is. it goes to the point of hmm, do I, is this really something that would be appropriate for me to adopt or adapt to? Because yes, if I adapt to this, it means I dilute my own culture. So before we can adapt, we actually need to be able to accept what we want to adapt to is okay and is appropriate. And so we're in this dilemma that, yes, we want to adapt to, but we want to resist it at the same time. And this is very clear from that Obelix and Asterix example of the menia. And I, I really like that example. So um, thank you for bringing that up because, you know, the menia is, if you think about it, in the iceberg, it's a visible expression. And so you could ask yourself, what's wrong with adapting a menia to an obelisk shape because, hey, it's just visible. Does it change my value system or not? And so, again, for some people, it's just that. And for other people, it goes to the core of the value system. So it's a really, really difficult um, thing. And and obelisk sort of seems to show a little bit more openness than asterisk <laughs> in, this, in, this, um, in this case because asterisk is, hey, we've got to stay Gaulois. You know, and Obelix is quite happy to, to to try something new, and this is one of the one of the the core things in the Asterix and the Obelix series, whether it's the movies or the comic strips. It always starts out with this prelude of how in 50 BC Gaul is occupied by the Romans, but not entirely because there's this village of uh, Gauls who are you know frantically resisting uh, the Roman invaders. So this is another wonderful for me, cultural part of the whole Asterix and Obelix series. It highlights all these cross-cultural, intercultural, multicultural challenges, and it also highlights the culture in which it emanated, from which it emanated, which is French culture. So I think, as I've already said before, um, we've got culture, but we've also got human nature. Um, human nature needs to protect itself. And when there is an external enemy, that takes precedence over anything else. And therefore, you protect the culture that you have. Uh, and we see how challenging this is, um, that intercultural, comp intercultural sensitivity is very lovely, but it doesn't always work because you've got these tensions of having to protect what is your own and you ca cannot always be open to other cultures. How do you explain the fact that the members of Asterix's village uh, often fight each other, even though they share the same culture and the same identity? The Asterix series is a wonderful microcosm of French culture as well. 
Um, and a lot of the research looks into the paradoxes of French culture. And when I was looking into this particular example, there is a quote from a management researcher that, um, that came up that I just have to share because it encapsulates exactly what goes on in this village. And it's by two British intercultural and management organizational researchers called Hickson and Pew. And it encapsulates everything that goes on in this village, which is that the French Revolution was fought for the ideals of individual freedom against central authority. The resulting contradictory combination of authority and freedom strongly influences every aspect of the French approach to managing and organising whether it's in a company or in a Gaul village. Culturally, the French approach is unique in the tension it embodies between looking for and responding to a strong authoritative lead while individually resisting the interference of a, to authority. And for me, that um, very much shows what goes on in this, um, in this village in Gaul. Pragmatically speaking, perhaps being multicultural is not the best option. Should we rather restrict ourselves to uh, what we all have in common, so our shared values and our shared common ground? And this prompts the idea of universalism. Would this be better? So it's a great question, and I'm going to answer it with another question. How do we know what our common values are or what our common ground is without actually going to investigate it? If we don't investigate it, we remain in what Leray Barna calls this assumption of similarity, that we actually have these same deep common values. And this is something that is probably not going to be achievable in a way that satisfies everybody. What about in a professional working context? Are there any tools or tricks that can help us to, you know, to have working matters run smoothly? Of course we can. It's a very nice follow on from the previous question because, you know, all of it requires work. It doesn't happen automatically. Common ground can be created if we understand the others, but if we also understand ourselves. And um, we need to get from this idea of cross-cultural through multicultural to intercultural understanding if we want to work, not only work, but also live together effectively. And it can work and it is very well possible, as you and I both know, but it takes time and it takes effort. You know, we're in this very global environment and it's easy to think that because we have been exposed to different cultures in some way, shape or form, that we're going to find it easier today to do this than maybe in previous generations because we've just, you know, we've been to many places, um, we, we work with people from different cultures but actually, the research has shown that this is not necessarily the case. So, for example, when Ham Hammer and Bennett put together their developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, they, they developed five stages going from very ethnocentric and monocultural to very ethno-relative and multicultural. When they developed a psychometric assessment, and when, what they found was that when people answered it, they felt that they were much more culturally sensitive than in fact the results showed they were, which means we've got a bit of work to do. <laughs> um, and other research by Brinkman and Van Vindenberg showed that it's not so much the places you go and visit, which is what Asterix does, right? He goes and visits lots of places, but it's the relationships you form that make you much better more sensitive to cultural difference, but also to be able to overcome it. So a lot of research has been done around cultural competence and what this requires. There are loads of assessment. Christopher Early was one of the very first ones to um, to develop tools to uh, to do this. And and for me, I believe that there are you know many different tools and techniques all of them start however with awareness and self-awareness we've got to look into ourselves we've got to understand who we are 
not only culturally, but also from um, from a personality point of view. Um, and then we've got to also understand the other. You cannot understand and become culturally competent and interculturally effective if you do not um, know where you come from and where the other comes from. So understanding, knowledge and awareness is absolutely crucial. Okay, so the more self-aware we are, the more interculturally competent we are. So I have another question. Should we really avoid stereotypes? <laughs> are are they harmful? We both know that there are a lot of um, good jokes that are based on stereotypes. And, and the, in the Asterix um, series, there are a lot of stereotypes. So what do you think about this? Well, they can be funny and they can be very hurtful. Um, I think we, what we have to admit is that they are everywhere. Stereotypes are part of life. Um, it is also one of Leray Barner's stumbling blocks to intercultural communication. So stereotypes and you and I have probably had stereotypes about our own cultural backgrounds that may not be that complementary. So we know that they can be very hurtful. And yet we need to accept that, that it's automatic that people do it. And sometimes they persist for centuries and centuries. There's a lovely scene um, in uh, Asterix in Britain with the, the English lawn about it being, you know, kept, well kept for 2000 years to look beautiful. And then, of course, the Romans run rampage over it. But this is the kind of thing, not every British lawn is like this, you know, not every German is punctual and very well organized. And hey, I speak from experience here, you know. Um, so I think one of the things to really um, be aware of is that we start out with a stereotype and it may be useful because it's a first bit of knowledge about another culture. However, we need to be able to get to the point that not every German is punctual. Not every Englishman eats boiled beef or whatever, um, but that some of them do. And some of them are. So we need to be very careful with our words. We need to be very careful with what we say and how we say it. But I think we also need to realize that they're inevitable. And the other thing, of course, is that there are positive stereotypes. So at the end of each episode of Asterix, everyone is united around the table, um, around the traditional banquet. Is food the solution? Food is a huge solution. Food makes the world go round and we all need to eat, right? Food is great. So I've been doing an intercultural career um, professionally. I have taught it, trained it um, for 20 odd years. And I, re I know that food is one of the tips I give in every company who have problems with people from different cultures that they work with. Um, and... Um, and it breaks down so many barriers. I do need to give one very pertinent example of how important food is. Uh, I was doing an intercultural training um, workshop for trade union uh, members from Germany, France and Britain many years ago. And they were supposed to work on something together to define uh, a project together. And they were full of suspicion towards each other because all of them thought that the other was wanted something from them and they were going to lose that typical thing that we talked about earlier. And we organized a dinner and the next morning at breakfast, one of them said to me, but Anka, this is great because we actually all want the same thing. And I thought that they wanted this and they wanted that and it was all going to be terrible. But we all want the same thing. Food unites. Food unites. So to finish with, you you talked about cultural dissolution. I think we need to answer this question at the end. Does multiculturalism mean giving up your identity? For me, um, no, we do not need to give up our identity. I think it goes back to understanding who you are and what is really important to you um, and to understand that there are things that you cannot change, that you will not change because then you will no longer be you. But there are also things that you can adopt from other cultures, maybe like the obelisk 
in among many minias in in Gaul that will enrich and enhance your intercultural interactions. But again, it requires understanding yourselves and actually understanding what is your identity. Thank you very much, Anka. Thank you, Mary, and I think it's time for coffee and cake. With milk. <laughs> With milk. <laughs> <laughs> Were the Romans really that crazy? In any case, Schema Business School has made multiculturalism a reality. Did you know that the school has nine locations on five continents? To find out more, visit www.schema.edu.